This video is brought to you by Manscaped. Join over 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with their most precious assets. Get 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the offer code SKILLUP at manscaped.com. Gamers, my Rona isolation is now complete, meaning that I'm officially free to go outside and live life. And I can think of no better way to celebrate that freedom than to stay inside all day playing video games, which is exactly what I'm going to do. I mean, that Destiny season pass isn't going to complete itself, is it? <laughs> Please don't dislike the video. A lot of news to get through this week from a Nintendo Direct to Sony making PlayStation themed monitors to more cyberpunk drama. Damn, just when you thought we could all move on from that, it keeps finding ways to rope us back in. Okay, time's a wasting. Here comes the news. Let's knock over that cyberpunk news first. Jesus. All right. So this week, the YouTube channel Upper Echelon Gaming came into possession of what he claimed are authentic documents from outsourced QA provider Quantic Lab, who were contracted by CD Projekt Red to assist with QA work for Cyberpunk 2077. The documents detail a raft of information, including testing files, human resource information, and more. And Upper Echelon believes the documents to be authentic, and Quantic Lab did not contest the authenticity of those documents when they did eventually respond to the matter, though they did contest some of the claims that Upper Echelon Gaming made when he reported on it all. The documents allege that Quantic Lab oversold their capabilities to CD Projekt Red, promising more staff to the project than they currently had employed, leading to fast hiring and frantic training of those new hires. Allegedly, the people involved in the QA were more junior team members, with even Project Project leads having less than one year's experience on the job. One of the more damning allegations is one of a bug quota where staff were required to report at least 10 bugs a day, leading to lots of minor and inconsequential bugs being highlighted, reducing the focus on more important bugs and issues. In response to the matter, Quantic Lab did not contest this bug quota claim. This report has been taken up more broadly as a sort of explanation for why Cyberpunk had so many bugs, but I don't think that's an accurate reading. YouTuber Legacy Killer HD claims to have spoken to a number of CD Projekt Red developers about the report, and they refute the assertion that Quantic Lab are to blame. Legacy Killer quoted one anonymous source saying, quote, anything that flows in is screened by internal QA, production, and devs. It's not like we're morons and spend hours on obviously bad bugs. Management not knowing about the bugs issues is laughable. They knew, everyone knew, they would play the game all day, every day, end quote. So did Quantic Lab mismanagement contribute to Cyberpunk being so buggy best we can say is maybe but are they the cause of it definitely not that responsibility falls squarely on the shoulders of city project red management and i'd be very cautious of any narrative that tries to deflect blame elsewhere another game that's had its development process in the headlines is sonic and no i'm not talking about the upcoming sonic frontiers which has most of us at least a little worried but the recently released sonic origins this is like the 60th re-release of these classic Sonic games, and so you'd think it'd be pretty smooth sailing, but nope, they really did find a way to fuck it up. The game is sitting at a mixed 58% positive on Steam, owing largely to a plethora of bugs and glitches that have found their way into the new versions, and that's setting aside all the pre-order bullshit, where you have to pay extra if you want stuff like animated menus. You can't make this stuff up. The Sonic 3 and Knuckles portion of the game was being developed by a studio called Head Cannon, and this is the team that had earlier led the development of Sonic Mania, one of the highest rated Sonic games in years. In a rare public thread, Head Cannon's founder, Simon Tomley, took to Twitter to make it clear that he and his team are not happy with the final product, taking responsibility for their own mistakes, but also making clear that the working conditions set by Sega made their task extremely difficult. Quote, We knew going in that there would be a major time crunch, and we worked ourselves into the ground to meet it just so this would even be made and released. End quote. He went on to say, quote, Every one of us is very unhappy about the state of Origins and even the Sonic 3 component. We weren't too thrilled about its pre-submission state either, but a lot was beyond our control." End quote. This is not common. Typically, these sorts of outsource relationship disagreements remain behind closed doors, but it's kind of cool that this dude is just out there telling it how it is. It's his company's reputation on the line, and if he and his people aren't to blame for how things landed, then yeah, good on him for setting the record straight. Will Sega see it that way? I don't know about that. Continuing with the troubled game development theme, where better to turn next than Battlefield 2042? This week, the new boss of the studio, Rebecca Kutas, did her first interview since taking the top job last November, and she said that DICE was all in on Battlefield 2042. Quote, We are only focusing on Battlefield 2042. There is no time for anything else. In three years, we want to be the first person to shoot a powerhouse that DICE deserves to be, and that is what we're going for, end quote. 
A lot to unpack here. Firstly, it's a bummer that DICE, who for decades had been a first-person shooter powerhouse, now sets a three-year timeline to regain that status. Secondly, they're only focused on Battlefield 2042. Only? I just don't believe that. They've wound down their hazard game mode, they've just released one new map, and the roadmap they've issued is really light on content. There are hundreds of people working at DICE, and you mean to tell me that the only thing they're working on right now is Battlefield 2042? I don't think so. There were reports a few weeks back that Battlefield 2042 had been reduced to a skeleton support staff, which is probably not totally accurate, but I bet it's a hell of a lot more accurate than the suggestion that DICE are only working on 2042 right now. Come on. Okay, so that's Cyberpunk, Sonic, Battlefield 2042. What say we bring things home with the day before? The very, very division-looking MMO that just so happens to be the most wishlisted game on Steam. Recently, like six weeks before the game was meant to launch, the developers announced that they were delaying the game until March of next year, since they're moving from Unreal Engine 4 to Unreal Engine 5, a move that most developers I spoke to said might be possible in that time frame, but it would depend on a lot of things and we should all be kind of cautious about that timeline. Recently, the developer Fantastic updated their website and Australian publication Well Played spotted something weird. It turns out that everyone who works for Fantastic is a volunteer, even if they're getting paid. To quote their website, there are two types of volunteers at Fantastic, full-time and part-time. Full-time volunteers work for salaries and their number is limited. Anyone can be a part-time volunteer and contribute to the fantastic community and get cool rewards, participation certificates, and free codes. Part-time volunteering at Fantastic includes various activities ranging from translating to community moderating. Part-time volunteers can also offer their unique skills to improve our projects and create new special features." End quote. That's pretty fucked up language. Framing the paid work you do as volunteering is manipulative since it opens the door to stuff like, hey, wanna work some extra unpaid hours? We're all volunteers here anyway. Secondly, I don't think the most wishlisted game on Steam should be outsourcing any part of its development to unpaid volunteers. Fantastic would clarify that this unpaid work does not relate to quote, code writing or development itself, end quote but to things like localization and moderation. Setting aside the fact that localization is absolutely part of development, it's messed up that people are contributing to this project and not being paid for it. A further response to Well Played said that the reason they're using volunteers to handle localization is that they paid an outsourced provider for that service for their other game, Prop Night, but they weren't happy with the results. I'm sorry, but the answer to that isn't to rope in volunteers, but to pay for a better localization. Finally, they mentioned that some part-time volunteers can be converted to full-time if they're lucky. And that's all sorts of red flags right there, as the promise of permanent paid work is often used to wrangle uncompensated labor out of junior level staff. I know most of this is a cynical reading, but this studio has not given us any reason to extend to them the benefit of the doubt. The trailers they've showcased are for a game that looks like a next-gen Division, only with more features. The Division took thousands of people over five years to build, and Fantastic is a small studio whose previous games have been small-scale projects with very basic visuals. I remain very, very skeptical about this one. All right, how about some good news for a change? Valve are gonna start pumping out more Steam decks. Quote, Hello, some great news on the production front. We just sent the last batch of quarter two emails and we'll start sending quarter three reservation emails on the 30th. Production has picked up and after today, we'll be shipping more than double the number of Steam decks every week, end quote. That is rad and hopefully it puts us one step further to seeing the Steam Deck made available in other territories, including my fatherland. I can confirm that the Steam Deck does function when held upside down, so it will be safe to use in Australia. While it may get easier to wrap your hands around Valve's big new deck, you might find it significantly harder to wrap your hands around Uncle Phil's joystick. That's right, Xbox controllers are experiencing a crippling stock shortage at the moment. What did, what did you think I meant? It's pretty much impossible to buy an Xbox controller anywhere in Europe right now, for example, and Microsoft acknowledged this issue this week to VGC saying, quote, we know it may be hard finding Xbox wireless controllers right now due to supply disruptions. We're working as fast as possible with our manufacturing and retail partners to improve this. Please check with your local retailer for availability, end quote. Hey, here's something messed up. Soon Riot will be listening to your voice chat in Valorant. The company says it's to train some new AI bot thing that will eventually be able to verify violations of behavioral policies, okay? Personally, I don't love the idea of any company recording what I'm saying for any reason, but I know that lots of people support this sort of stuff because it helps reduce toxicity. I think reducing toxicity is an admirable goal. I support it. 
But I don't want Riot and its investors sitting on millions of hours of voice recorded data. There's no way that doesn't end badly. Speaking of ending badly, Bobby Kotick was just re-elected to the board of Activision Blizzard. Proving that irony is alive and well, Bobby Kotick was re-elected by a shareholder vote after a board published report absolved the board of any wrongdoing. Nice. The irony is especially rich since Bobby Kotick is reported to have intervened to protect people credibly accused of sexual harassment and he threatened to have his secretary killed. You know, just normal CEO banter. J. Allen Brack is still out in his ass despite not having half the rap sheet that Bobby's racked up, but when you're the boss and you have around you an army of yes men and profit obsessed investors, it's pretty easy to get away with murder. Or at least threatening murder, I guess. This news comes in the same week as some truly disastrous, heartbreaking Activision news. We were gonna get Tony Hawk 3 and 4 remakes, and now we're not anymore. The news comes from Mr. 900 himself, Tony Hawk, who during a recent stream confirmed that he had been approached about the remakes of the classic games, and they were going to be led by Vicarious Visions, who did an absolutely sterling job remaking Tony Hawk 1 and 2. That team, though, was merged into Blizzard, and since Activision didn't trust any other studio to hit the quality bar that Vicarious Visions hit, the whole project was scrapped. This is shitty, shitty news, and it's pretty astounding how consistently Activision can come up with new ways to disappoint us. Finally, while we're on the topic of Blizzard, it was confirmed this week that Overwatch 2 will replace Overwatch 1 when it launches in October. Overwatch 1 will no longer be playable, and the client will be updated to become Overwatch 2. Some people are a little bit upset by this, as it's a blow to game preservation, but I do think that online competitive experiences are meant to evolve with time. I don't think anyone is bummed out that the 1.0 build for League of Legends isn't an officially supported client. But to be fair, I have actually seen some revival projects trying to bring stuff like that back. Point is, Overwatch 2 is going to be the only Overwatch game in town very soon. Hey, here's something interesting. Sony are getting into the gaming monitors and headset space. Announced just yesterday, Sony are bringing two new products to market under their new InZone label. The first is a very PS5 looking headset that comes in wired, wireless and noise cancelling variants. And they're pricing them at the premium end of the market, with the top model going for 450 Australian dollars. That's probably like 300 US dollars or so. The more interesting items are the two in-zone monitors, both of which are 27 inch, but one of them is 4K 144Hz and it has two HDMI 2.1 ports, meaning it's perfect for both PC and PS5 gaming, while the other model is 1080p 240Hz, meaning it's more suited to PC gaming, particularly first person shooters. The decision to market these under a new in-zone label is kind of weird since I think these products would have likely found more cut through if they were positioned under the PlayStation label. Regardless, the headsets and monitors are both hitting in the next few weeks and early reviews have been very positive indeed. Let's do a quick whip around of that Nintendo third party direct that aired last night. Nintendo did make clear that this one would not include any information on first party titles like Zelda or Metroid. And for once, people actually listened and they did not let their expectations get completely out of hand. The result was a solid show full of low key reveals and people walked away generally pretty happy with it. As always, plenty of ports announced because that's kind of the Switch's thing. One of the more exciting was Nier Automata, the end of your high edition, a Switch version of Yoko Taro's masterpiece, one of the greatest games ever made, I will die on that hill. The Your High Edition includes a whole bunch of cosmetics, including a few exclusive to the Switch, so that's nice. That's arriving October 6th. Bomberman is back. Super Bomberman 2 arrives for the Switch sometime in 2023, as does the Mega Man Battle Network Legacy Collection, which has 10 games split into two volumes. People really love them some Mega Man, so they were pretty pumped to see this one. Sticking with the retro revival theme, Pac-Man is also back. Everyone's favorite gluttonous fear returns in a remake of Pac-Man World, which originally launched on the PlayStation way back in the way back when. This remake touches things up a ton and it's out August 26th. Blonk is a really nice looking co-op adventure game. Hand drawn and monochromatic, this one looks ready to hit you in the feels. It's out October 23rd next year. Hey, we got a new Monkey Island trailer and it looks so awesome that I'm just gonna play some of the trailer for you now. Roll it, Austin. <laughs> Fantastic, love everything about it, can't wait. No release date for this one yet, but we do know that it's headed to Switch first for consoles. I'm gonna guess that the PC and Switch versions arrive at the same time based on that language. One of the best things that Ubisoft have put out in the last few years was Mario Rabbids, and they're making a sequel and it looks awesome. And it just got a release date, October 20th. This is very high on my list, and if you haven't yet played the original, then please go and do so. It's one of the best tactics games ever made, and no, I am not joking. Oh my god, we got some Sonic Frontiers footage that didn't totally suck. Take a look. 
you can also enter a special zone called cyberspace. Take on challenges at supersonic speeds and grab keys to progress. Inarguably, this is a significant improvement over everything shown to this point, and the faint flickers of optimism begin to shine through. Perhaps this won't be a total dumpster fire after all, but I don't know, man. I'm still going to wait until I get my hands on the finished product before I get remotely hyped. It's still slated for later this year, believe it or not, and uh, yeah, we'll see. If Spirit T is Stardew Valley meets Spirited Away, then Disney's Dreamlight Valley is Stardew Valley meets... well, Disney. You live in a magical village populated by Disney characters and you help them do normal slice of life stuff and I'm not gonna lie, that sounds pretty good actually. It's out in early access on September 6th and I think that might be the first time the Switch is doing an early access title. I don't know. Microsoft confirmed that Minecraft Legends was also coming to Switch. This is the third time they've shown the game without explaining what it actually is, so they've given Deathloop a run for its money. Expect approximately 400 more trailers before launch. If you haven't played Portal yet, what the fuck, dude? What have you been doing? Go play Portal. And if you like, you can play it now on the Switch, since both Portal 1 and Portal 2 are now available on Nintendo's handheld. Another slice of life game shown off during this Direct was Harvestella, which has a kind of goofy name, but it actually looks pretty nice, to be honest. It's from Square Enix, and it's out on November 4th. And finally, the news the Joker avatars have been begging for, for literally years, Persona 5 is headed to the Switch. And not just Persona 5, but Persona 3 Portable and Persona 4 Golden. This is the money shot. The last great weeb property not yet ported to the Switch. And so now, with their thirst satiated, the anime profile pics can finally rest. This all kicks off on October 21st when Persona 5 Royal will be released. Same time as for Xbox and Steam, with Persona 3 and 4 following later. So yeah, pretty good showcase, I think. Well done, Mario. So, what got announced or delayed this week? Well, outside of the Nintendo third-party showcase, we got some more Persona news. We learned that the Xbox version of Persona 5 Royal will launch with every single piece of Persona 5 Royal DLC included. That's over 40 items, most of them cosmetic, and they're all in there. Unclear if the same generosity is being extended to the Steam or Switch ports of the game, but I guess we'll find out soon enough. Into the Breach was a unique turn-based strategy game that made its way onto more than a few Game of the Year lists back when it released in 2018. This week, the developer Subset Games announced a free update that would hit on July 19th. It includes new squads and weapons, new pilots and pilot abilities, new bosses, and an all-new difficulty mode. Plus, it's getting a mobile port courtesy of Netflix. If you have a Netflix subscription, you'll be able to play Into the Breach on either iOS or Android from the 19th of July onwards. This is the first time I've noticed any game making its way to Netflix. Like, I know that there have been games on Netflix, but this is the first time I've noticed a game I actually care about. So I wonder if Netflix is sharpening up their curation and marketing. Surprise, World of Warcraft's next expansion, Dragonflight, is arriving this year. You'd think that everyone would be doing fist pumps and high fives like the end of a Top Gun movie, but everyone's kind of really bummed out and nervous and worried, like the beginning of a Top Gun movie. Reason being that this expansion is not yet in public beta testing, where previous expansions have been well into their testing windows if they were less than six months from release. The worry is that Blizzard are rushing this out the door, and given that they have comprehensively bungled most of their major releases over the last few years, I don't think that's an unwarranted concern. There's no specific release date for the expansion yet, it was just promised to arrive at some point on or before December 31st this year, so a November release is likely, but it's anyone's guess. Finally, what if I told you that the team behind Alien Isolation just unveiled a new first-person shooter this week? Would you believe me? Probably not, because I can't remember a time when a studio and a team with this sort of track record and reputation announced a game only for that announcement to get absolutely no traction whatsoever. The studio is Creative Assembly, best known for their Total War series, but within that studio is a team who created the incredible Alien Isolation, to this day one of the greatest survival horror experiences ever made. There were rumours that this team was working on a new game for a while now, and everyone had hoped it would be a sequel to Alien Isolation. Not so much. Turns out it's something called Hyenas, and it's a class-based hero shooter thing where people fight in zero-g and all the characters look a little bit zany. I hate to sound so cynical, but like, oh man, nothing about this trailer appealed to me. It just looks like every other edgy, competitive shooter, brawler, hero thing we've ever seen. And I'm also bummed out that this team is making it, because I really wanted an Alien Isolation 2. I think we all did. 
So yeah, I'm keeping an open mind, don't get me wrong, but at the same time, I'm really, really not feeling this one. So what came out last week? Well, first up, we had the latest expansion to the Elder Scrolls Online. It's called High Isle. This one is set in the home of the Britons and it offers up a new area to explore, new quest lines to complete, new lore to uncover. It's a little bit early to fully evaluate the worthiness of an MMO expansion, but initial reviews are generally positive. It's sitting at 68% mixed on Steam, which isn't great, but critics seem more impressed with it as it's sitting at a strong 75 on Open Critic. Fextra Life reviewed this one and scored an 8 out of 10, saying, quote, the expansion holds roughly 30 hours of content, not only providing a solid main quest line, but also plenty of side quests, volcanic events, new enemies, and card collectible fun along the way. If you enjoy mystery, political intrigue, and diving into dark crypts, this one is for you, end quote. Fall Guys went free to play last week. No point in reviewing that one, since we all know the deal, but the game did hit 20 million players for the first time after that move to free to play. That's pretty awesome, and a reminder of the enduring appeal of one of the biggest surprise hits of the last few years. Capcom released the Capcom Fighting Collection last week, a collection of 10 classic fighting games, seven of which you've probably never heard of. I certainly hadn't. Critics and fans alike are very happy with this one. On Steam, it's sitting at a super impressive 93% very positive, while critics have it at a strong 78 on Open Critic. IGN scored it an 8, saying, quote, Capcom Fighting Collection contains some great classics and fun rarities in a fantastic package. Despite containing a few sus suspect emissions and lacking crossplay, this is a collection worth collecting." End quote. Finally, Nintendo dropped the latest chapter in the Fire Emblem saga this week, Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes. This isn't the sprawling tactics-based experience that the mainline games deliver, but rather a Musou game spin-off developed by Koei Temko. Think Dynasty Warriors except with cooler anime haircuts. This is an offshoot series that's done well for itself in the past, and the latest entry continues in that tradition, sitting at a strong 80 on Open Critic. Eurogamer loved this one, recommending it and saying, quote, Three Hopes is genuinely impressive. It walks a fine line between freshness for existing fans and approachability for newer players, and personally, it's had me invested from the start. I'd love to see where Nintendo's Musou spin-off concept goes next, end quote. While Polygon were less enthused, saying, quote, It truly is fine, and all the proper elements are in place, but in many ways, it's also very expected and not particularly innovative. It makes me wonder, not for the first time, how much longer it's fine will be enough in the world of Musou titles, end quote. So that was last week. What about this week? A moderately stacked week of releases kicked off by Escape Academy, arriving on all platforms bar the Switch on the 28th. Now, this is essentially an escape room game that supports both local and online co-op. When I was in LA a few weeks back this one was playable on the show floor and everyone who got their hands on it absolutely loved it great vibes all around and yeah it's rare to find local co-op games so it's always nice when a new one comes along mx vs atv legends hits xbox and playstation consoles on the 28th the greatest grudge match since truckosaurus v I don't know, Optimus Prime? I know nothing about this game other than it features vehicles of both the two-wheeled and four-wheeled variants. So yeah, that's all I got for you. I do know a little bit more about Cuphead's upcoming DLC, The Delicious Last Course, which arrives on all platforms on the 30th. The game that made that one journalist famous for all the wrong reasons, Cuphead is back with a brutally difficult but always charming final serve of content. This one features a new playable character, Miss Chalice, who has her own unique moveset that can be used to play through the entire game, not just the DLC. There's new locations to explore, new enemies to jump over and on, new bosses to fight, and some awesome new music to bop along to. The title implies that this will be the last DLC we'll see for Cuphead, so it'll be interesting to see where developer Studio MDHR go next. Two major expansions releasing this week. The first is Outriders World Slayer, releasing for PC, Xbox, and PlayStation on the 30th. I played and reviewed this one actually, and it's complicated. It's a little reductive to be like, it's more Outriders, but it totally is. It's a campaign that you can get through in a few hours. It's a storyline that's not great. And it's an endgame activity that starts to feel pretty repetitive pretty fast. The crown jewel of World Slayer is a massive expansion to the gear and build craft portions of the game. You can now make even stronger characters with even crazier builds, but you're still doing exactly the same stuff you were doing in the base game. So unless you were already on board the Outriders hype train and you were totally down for just more of that, and I don't think this expansion is going to be the one that entices you. Potential or lapsed players will probably find themselves wanting a little more innovation, and the $35 price tag for this one is a little steep. This will eventually come down in price, and I'm guessing it'll one day hit Game Pass. That might be a good time to check it out when that happens. If you want more detail on World Slayer, I'll leave a link to my review below. The second big expansion to hit this week is Monster Hunter Rise's Sunbreak expansion, which has a simultaneous release for both Switch and PC on the 30th. 
The first and likely only expansion to the Switch and PC exclusive, Sunbreak adds dozens of new and returning monsters to the mix, huntable in a new location and with the assistance of an improved wire bug, granting additional moves to every one of the game's 14 weapons. While Rise wasn't my favorite Monster Hunter entry, there's really no such thing as a bad Monster Hunter game, as the consistent excellence that Capcom serves up makes it a very, very safe place to park both your money and your time. Reviews for this one should be up by the time this video goes live, so we'll check back on those next week. And finally, there's a new F1 game coming out, F1 22. It allows you to go around and around in circles faster than ever before. I'm joking, but only because I don't know shit about F1. I do know that this one is made by Codemasters though, and that is a serious team of racing game veterans, and the game will ship with a VR mode, which is kind of cool. I saw some people playing it in LA, and it looked both motion-inducing and awesome. F122 arrives July 1st for all platforms by the Switch. Okay, so first up for our weekly put this on your radar segment, I'll plug my Indies Volume 2 video, which went out last week. I covered 25 indie titles, all of which were playable during the recent Steam Next Fest, and all of which were excellent. No filler, just top shelf shit, and if you want to pile your wish list sky high, then I'll leave a link to that video below the like button. With that out the way, put this on your radar. This is SA Proxy, I think that's how you say it, from developer From South Games. You might have recently seen this one promoted by Asmund Gold during the OTK Games Expo. Angerfoot may be trying to bring Hotline Miami into the first person perspective, but SA Proxy seems to be very comfortable with a top down view, though it does adopt 3D visuals and a very cyberpunk esque aesthetic. Laser swords, giant mechs, car chases, boss battles. This isn't just a twitchy arcade shooter for points, but a story-driven action game involving three playable characters, each of whom have their own unique abilities to add to the chaos. I love the look of this, the diversity of setting, the stylish cuts to close-ups during executions, the high stakes, breach and clear gameplay. The whole package just looks pretty rad, and I'll be booting it up when it hits on July 10th. If you're interested, I'll leave a link to the Steam page below. Sort of free stuff time, and we're in the last week of the month, which means it's time to scoop up all those PS Plus games, Games with Gold, and Twitch Prime offerings before they skedaddle. There's actually a lot to shout out this week, so let's get started with Epic, who are giving away Game of Thrones, the board game, okay, I guess, as well as Car Mechanic Simulator 2018. My eyes generally glaze over whenever I hear any game title that ends in the word simulator, except for Goat Simulator, of course. But hey, if you're into cars, then hopefully this one does something for you. Grab these quick because on July 1st, the lineup will tick over, replaced by two new offerings. The first is Gene Forge 1 Mutagen, which appears to be some sort of monster breeding fantasy game where you breed an army of little dinosaur looking things and then use them to conquer the world. The other title is Eratus Lord of the Dead, which is a turn based tactical roguelike released back in 2020. Cool art style, 78% mostly positive on Steam, not too much else to say about that one. Game Pass is having a more quiet month than usual, but still some good stuff to shout out here. The Shadowrun Trilogy is on there, I totally forgot last week this was already announced as a Game Pass title, so yep, there it is. Naraka Blade Point is that martial arts battle royale game. Far Cry 5 is Far Cry 5. I actually really like this one because I think the creepy pasta thing works super well. Some serious Jared Leto energy here, anyway. For console and PC, you can now get FIFA 2022 through EA Play, which comes bundled with Game Pass. And for PC, you can get Creative Assembly's Total War Three Kingdoms, a series that isn't as popular as its other history and fantasy-based offerings, but it's apparently no less good. Twitch Prime is getting ready to celebrate Prime Day, which happens on July 12th. There's gonna be some huge games dropping when that happens, not least of all the Mass Effect Trilogy Legendary Edition. For now though, Uncle Jeff is giving away a boatload of smaller titles, including stuff like WRC 8, Escape from Monkey Island, Far Cry 4, Metal Slug, The King of Fighters 2002, and a ton of other stuff. For real, if you have an Amazon Prime subscription, there's literally like $300 worth of games you can download right now, so that's pretty good. The PS Plus lineup isn't officially confirmed, but it has leaked through an extremely reliable source. And so this coming month, you can expect the excellent Crash Bandicoot 4, It's About Time, the Love It or Hate It Dark Pictures Anthology, Man of Medan, and for PS5, the newly releasing Arcade Again, which is a co-op PvE game with some PvP minigames thrown in for fun. I'm not sure what to make of this yet, as it seems to combine a variety of different game modes into a single package, but yeah, it hits on the 8th of July, so we'll all find out then. Finally, and very briefly, Don't Nod's Tell Me Why is free on Xbox and Steam until the end of June to celebrate Pride Month. It's all chapters, 100% free, so grab them fast. 
Our feel-good story for the week falls into one of my favorite feel-good categories. People on the internet making shit that should be pretty much impossible. When the PlayStation 5 was first unveiled, people were like, That's a huge bitch! PlayStation 5 is one of the biggest consoles ever put to market, and immediately attention turned to the question of when the hell they were going to slim this thing down, since that was something that every prior PlayStation had delivered at some point in the product lifecycle. However, stock shortages being what they are, we're unlikely to get a slim PS5 anytime soon, so YouTuber DIY Perks took matters into his own hands. Through some absolutely incredible engineering that would have seen him tried and burned at the stake as a warlock in another time, DIY managed to convert the PS5 from this to this. This sleek copper monolith, not even two centimeters tall, is an actual functioning PS5. And in fact, it's better than the original because DIY has put in a liquid cooling system. There is water being pumped through this thing to keep it cool. And if you take the time to watch how this guy built this, it's astounding. Is it likely we'll see a liquid cooled copper plated two centimeter thick PS5 in the future? No, the materials for this alone cost more than a PS5 if you bought it from a scalper on eBay. So if and when we do get a slim model, it's probably not going to be as sleek or impressive as this. That just makes DIY's one-of-a-kind unit all the more special. If you want to see the full process for how he pulled it off, I'll leave a link to that video below the like button. It really is worth a watch. It's, it's amazing. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the week in video games. Tomorrow, I'll be recording episode two of the Friends Per Second podcast with my friends Jake Baldina from Game Ranks, Gerard, aka The Completionist, and Lucy James from GameSpot. So if you want to get in on that, that'll be up over the weekend on this channel. And it'll also be on podcast platforms as well. Link to those below the like button. If you enjoyed this video, then as always, a like would be super appreciated, as would your subscription, as would digging the notification bell. Have a great weekend. Oh, and also, don't forget to shave your balls. Wait, what? Gentlemen, let me ask you something. Are you taking care down there? I'm not talking about your sneaker game, I'm not talking about skipping leg day, and I'm certainly not talking about your choice of swimming apparel. Though to be fair, budgie smugglers are related. Don't Google budgie smugglers, by the way. It's an Australian thing and we're not proud of it. I'm talking about taking care of the family jewels. You want them to be at all times clean, well-maintained and presentable. Because if there is one thing that gamers are known for, it is their raw, irresistible sexual magnetism. And with great power comes the great responsibility to manscape. If you are just beginning your intimate grooming journey, then can I recommend the Performance Package 4.0, the latest and greatest offering from Manscape, and one that's sure to meet both your needs and the needs of people meeting your other needs. Inside this package, you'll find the Lawn Mower 4.0 trimmer, the Weed Whacker Ear and Nose trimmer, the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, the Crop Reviver Toner, Performance Boxer Briefs, and a travel bag to keep it all in one place. First off, that Lawn Mower 4.0, Manscaped says it's the greatest ball trimmer ever invented. And since they're pretty much the only entity who specializes in trimming balls, I'm inclined to believe them. These people, no balls. Their fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents, thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. The Lawn Mower 4.0 is waterproof and it also has a 400K LED spotlight in case you need a more precise shave. Ever wanted to spotlight your junk? Well, now you can. Please use responsibly. You thought that was good, but how about taking your grooming game to the next level? The Performance Pack 4.0 also includes the Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer. The Weed Whacker is also waterproof and provides proprietary skin safe technology, which helps reduce nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate nose holes. Their Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and Crop Reviver Ball Toner will change the way you approach your hygiene routine. Manscaped say, quote, your balls will thank you, end quote. Now, I don't know about you, but my balls have never thanked me for anything. And so I really hope these products deliver because I am sick and tired of my ungrateful balls. Manscaped even threw in two free gifts in their performance pack, the Manscaped boxes and the Shed travel bag. You can wear that t-shirt around so people will know. They'll nudge their friends and point at you and they'll be like, hey, see that guy over there? And the other person will say, yeah. And the other person will say, he shaves his balls. And then the other person will say, nice. It's time to take care down there. So go to manscaped.com and get 20% off and free shipping with the off code SKILLUP at manscaped.com. That's 20% with free shipping at manscaped.com using off code SKILLUP. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped.